is my was my mic off the whole time I was just speaking? You know what? 2021, 2020, this is just the theme of the two years. <laughs> but anyway, it's it's 401. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm sorry, work from home. I've got a dog in my lap. <laughs> um, I'm Rebecca Kluverdams, the Continuing Education and Emerging Technologies Librarian for the Central New York Library Resources Council. My pronouns are she, her. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Fundraising Beyond the Book Sale. We're very glad to have the Friends of the Library section of the New York Library Association as a co-sponsor for this event. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of some housekeeping. We will be utilizing the chat as well as the Q&A feature for this webinar. We'd appreciate it if you could change your settings in the chat so your messages are going to all panelists and attendees rather than just all panelists. You can change this by opening your chat box, clicking on the drop down menu above the text box and choosing all panelists and attendees. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself there now. I already saw some people doing so. We'd also like you to use the Q&A feature to ask questions so they don't get lost in the chat. You can find that towards the bottom center of your screen. Our presenters will be taking questions after each of their presentations. Live captioning is available for this webinar. To toggle the subtitles on or off, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and choose either show subtitle or hide subtitle. All attendees are expected to follow CLRC's code of conduct, which will be added to the chat shortly. To summarize, please treat all CLRC staff, event attendees and speakers with respect. Those who are not adhering to the code of conduct will be removed from the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be shared next week once the closed captioning has been edited. The email containing the link will also provide information about getting a certificate of attendance as well as copies of the presentations shown today. If you're interested in more events from both CLRC and other ESL and councils, please visit CLRC's event listing page. The link will be added to the chat shortly. Today, we'll be hearing from Rebecca Foose, the Director of Advancement for the Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library and a certified fundraising executive, followed by Kathy Shea and Jenny Godemo from the Wood Library in Canandaigua. <laughs> Kathy is a member of the Wood Library Board of Trustees, while Jenny is the Executive Director of the Library. Now, without further ado, I'd like to let our first presenter begin. Take it away, Rebecca. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca, for that introduction and for the invitation today. Let me get my screen share here. Are you seeing my, uh, my presentation? Looks great. Okay, terrific. So today I'm going to present three ideas that will describe how the Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library connected with people in personal ways to build or deepen a library relationship that led to greater giving. And those are Friends Tours, uh, annual campaign, or you might call it a membership campaign, and our Arnett Mural Project, which was a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser. And I hope that after this presentation, you'll be able to use my suggestions to adapt your current fundraising or plan a new library fundraiser. And I can learn from you. So as Rebecca said, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to as many of those afterwards as we can. So first of all, I'd like you to think about your current fundraising and let's use book sales as an example because we all do them. What works for you? Well, you certainly want to raise a lot of money and you certainly want to get rid of a lot of books. Now, what works for your donor? And you've probably heard donors say this at your book sales. Well, I could go buy a book at Barnes and Noble, but I really like to support the library. Or maybe they say, boy, we got to keep things out of the landfill. I like being able to buy a used book from you. Or maybe they like the thrill of finding that gem of a book that they didn't even know they needed, but they had to have it. So what works for us is transactional. What works for the donor or the shopper or the friend is a feeling. And that's based on relationship. So these tips may not bring in big money right away, but they'll strengthen the relationship with the donors 
and the trust that they put in the library for the future. The first one I want to talk about today is friends tours. These are great for friends groups to do. You all have things to be proud of. Think about what your friends groups have bought for your library. Show it off. What we wanted to do was we had two. Um, we wanted to thank our donors, uh, or you could say patrons or friends for their past support. And we also wanted to add an advocacy piece to this because a lot of people don't realize what great community resources libraries are in solving problems in our communities today. So we wanted to be sure that people had a, a good understanding of that. The who, when, and where, you would certainly tailor to your own libraries. Uh, the way we did it, we invited donors who had given to us for 10 or more years. And the when, uh, we were offering two tours a month, the second Tuesday morning of the month and the third Wednesday afternoon. These were 90 minutes long. It was about 60 minutes of actually walking around and seeing things, and then about 30 minutes of sitting and, and listening to donors uh, give some of their stories and their impressions. And where, again, that's entirely up to you and what you wanna show off in your library. We had five stops on our tour. We went to our uh, main central hall. We went to the local history division, our business insight center, children's and teen services. And we included board members. This is a great opportunity for board members to give special thanks to your, your donors or friends. And we also included staff because staff acted kind of as docents in each of their divisions. Uh, who better to be able to convey thanks for the things that the friends have done to help them out. We also uh, at the end, we gathered into a room with some refreshments, just very simple. And I made sure we gathered everyone's contact information. Since we had sent invitations, we had most of them, but I wanted to be sure if anyone brought a, a daughter, a neighbor, a friend, that we had that as well. And we really, the tours gave a chance to show and not tell. We weren't just talking, but we were really showing the results of the gifts that people had made. And then we just sat and listened and said, you know, what surprised you? And people will tell you things if you just listen and see what's on their heart and what they're interested in. So this was our invitation. It was just a simple eight and a half by 11 sheet that we sent in, uh, sent along with our thank you letters to donors. And as you can see, it's very, uh, we try and keep it very donor centric, you know, be our guest. And in the, do the bold letters, thanks to donors like you. So we really wanted to leave people with a feeling that they were welcomed to come to this. Now, maybe you don't do mailings like that. You could put a poster up in your library, just make a big display and invite people and just see who, who comes, you know, whatever works out for, for your organization. And the results we had, it, it did build relationship and trust gave donors a feeling, and we really were able to find what interested the people in the room. So if I saw someone who was moved to tears about children's uh, literacy and reading, next time our library had a, a program or a plan for something new for children's literacy, you know I was gonna call that person and say, I know this means a lot to you. We have a new project we're working on. May I talk to you about it? they're willing to listen. November of 2019, intending to do a full year, but we were not uh, able to, of course, because of COVID, but we were able to do five months worth of tours. So we were able to tour 40 people from 28 households, and we still have a long mailing list. Of those 28 households, 15 have increased their giving, either giving a larger single gift or a second gift this fiscal year. 10 at the same level and three have decreased their giving or we haven't yet heard from them this year. Sometimes people prefer to give in the spring. Now, of course, we can't completely say that it was the tours that uh, increased our giving. Uh, you know, certainly it's been an unusual year. COVID has affected the economy. It's affected jobs and many other things. 
So I can't claim that the tours made all the difference, but we can say that they deepened the relationship and the feeling that the donor has about the library. And I know in one case, uh, when I did call someone who had made a generous donation, he said his wife specifically increased their gift as a result of the tour. So the second thing I'd like to mention is our annual campaign. You might call it a membership campaign or a friends campaign. But first I'd like you to think about your current friends members. Do you have any new members? And do your new members renew the following year? Do you retain your members? Now I'd like you to think about how you communicate with them. Do you send a letter? Do you send a brochure? And what does it say? Is it transactional? Is it our friends do this, 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 and here's how you join us? Or are you saying something to give the reader a good feeling about why they would want to join? Now, there are many, many sources of information on how to write an annual appeal letter. We use the expertise of a direct mail firm, Tim Thomas and Associates, in writing our donor letters. And he always kind of coaches me to remember to pay attention to the donor. And a simple way to do this is to, to begin some sort of a conversation to personalize something to build a relationship. And in our case, we just asked a simple question. What's the best book you've read in the last six months? We put that on the annual appeal slip and we got a tremendous response. This went out, our fiscal year is July to June. This went out in September. So the past six months, everybody had been locked down with the pandemic. And I'm sure if you're like me, you, the library was a great relief to be able to get reading material, to get books, to get online resources and programs. And our patrons and donors found that as well. So we got a great response to this. If you don't do a response slip like this, again, you could adapt this for your library. Make a, display, make a poster. What's the best book you've read in the last year? and have some kind of uh, a little form they could fill out where they can put in the information as well as putting in their contact information. Because from that, you can create a fabulous reading list and push it out to the people who responded to you. So you're building this relationship. You're asking them for something and then you're giving them something. This turned into our holiday card and we did it on constant contact. We printed a few. Uh, hard copies for people who don't use a computer, some of our special friends, but most people got it over constant contact, so the expense was very low. And we set it up so that each book, if you hovered over the book cover and clicked, it would take you to our card catalog. So if there was a book you wanted, you could see in real time if it was available, if it was an audio book or an ebook, you could get it immediately and start reading or listening. And if it was a hard book, hard copy book, uh, then you would be able to just put a hold on it and have it delivered to your local library. And people really liked this. We also had a lot of new first time donors that gave uh, in our fall campaign. And we wanted to give them a little special attention, so we just made a postcard. Your gift makes a difference. You see the front and the back here, it was just a four by six postcard. I hand addressed them. They went out after the thank you letter and I just wrote a little note, thank you for joining us in support of libraries. And it's just a way to say, we recognize that you gave the first time. Now this group who gave in the fall also got an appeal letter in the spring. And we put a special line in there for this particular group. And remember these days with, with such easy ways to cut and paste, you know, it's not Gutenberg. You can change things around very easily uh, in the body of a letter based on whatever segment you want to send to. So why not personalize it a little bit? We recognize that they gave a first time gift. We recognize that everybody's asking for money right now and you chose the library. So thank you very much. And as a result of this, again, we, we built a relationship. We recognized people's situations, appreciated how unique they were, and just tried to make it more personal. So we have 130 new donors so far in this fiscal year, which is wonderful. The industry standard for a first-time donor to give a second gift 
is only about 22%. If you can capture them for a second year, the retention rate goes up to give a third time gift to 63%. So you really want to try and get people to come back that second gift. And in this fiscal year already, we have 10 people who've given a second gift in the same year. Now we really won't know the results until next year because some people might want to give one gift a year, but I think we're well on our way and I'm confident in the relationships and some of the strategies that we're trying to, to put in place. And third, I want to just mention the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, and this is the Arnett Mural Project. Peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, there's a simple definition right here. It's pretty much getting anyone who cares about your organization to raise money for you. And these have been around, you know, forever, from children going door to door, uh, asking you to give a little bit of money for Jump Rope for Heart, or it could be a walkathon, it could be a bikeathon. More and more of them are going online. I'm sure you've seen them. You've seen Facebook fundraisers. You've seen GoFundMe. Maybe your friends have done one. Maybe your library has done one. The idea is to get people to give and to share with their followers or their public or whoever so that it just expands. So the director of the Arnett branch, first of all, the Arnett branch is one of 10 city neighborhood branches that are part of the Rochester Public Library along with our central library. You can see the beautiful murals on the outside of the building. And we have room for more, we have a few more panels. have gone on uh, for several campaigns. This most recent campaign was seven new murals. So five books, one CD case and one DVD case and in these, in this particular campaign, all of the uh, spines or the murals were either about or by African Americans or Native Americans. The director of the library knew that people were walking a lot. People were looking for something new and interesting. People wanted to get out of the house during COVID and take a nice walk and see something and had the idea that this would be great for the neighborhood. Arnett is a neighborhood that's very diverse racially and economically. There are a lot of people who are uh, urban by choice, homeowners, longtime uh, residents, and they're pockets of poverty. But in each case, there's a lot of foot traffic and uh, car traffic that go by and to the library. So this was an opportunity to say to the uh, people in the neighborhood, we care about you, we want to beautify the neighborhood, we want to give you something right now. So Bruce came to us, the, Bruce Tian, the director of the library, um, Arnett, came to us, he had the um, artist was willing to come back and do some more panels, he had a budget, he had the approval of the library administration, very important, and he also had capacity uh, the branch has uh, about 700 followers on Facebook. And I just want to ask you, do you know how many followers you have on Facebook in your library? You might be surprised how many people are following your library. Maybe your friends groups have your own Facebook pages. Check that out too. You know, if you have thousands of people, and you probably do, that's a lot of capacity. So use the donation pages either on Facebook, on GoFundMe, or we used our own database because we had that capability. But some of the things, I'll just do a couple of quick screenshots of how we set ours up, although this is not a tutorial on how to set up a fundraising page. But we started out not just saying what we wanted to do, but what, we, what the gift was going to be to the community. We want to beautify our net and we want to share the joy of reading. And it is hard to read that age box, but it says Langston Hughes, Harper Lee, Frederick Douglass, and other esteemed authors have room for more neighbors on the outside of the Arnett Branch Library. And then people would scroll down. They see the thermometer, that green bar across, because people do like to measure the progress. We recognize that not everybody wants to give online. So we have opportunity that they can write a check and mail it to us, and many people did. And there was also a tab where you could talk about the project. So we could talk about the foundation, we could talk about the Arnett Branch Library, and we could talk about the artist, Richmond Futch, 
and where else his work is shown in town and also his protégés that he was bringing along some young people to, uh, to help out. You'll notice in the lower right as well, we had a donor leaderboard that people could opt into. And people like that, they like to be able to see that they're part of the, part of the goal. Um, so that was, was popular as well. And Bruce Tian, the director of uh, the branch manager of Arnett, was feeding Facebook messages constantly through the campaign. We ran this campaign from August 20th through October 7th. So you could see he was kind of building up the hype. Here come the here come the mural. See, he's out there painting. See, don't they look great? And in every one, he would always thank. Uh, he thanked the Friends of Foundation, he thanked donors, he thanked Richmond, and he also always put in the link if you want to find out more about the project, if you want to give to the project. And these were shared and picked up by lots of groups. And I'll show you one here on the left. This was an unexpected surprise, a very good surprise. Caught the eye of the First Tuesday Book Club. This is a group um, who wanted to purchase books and give them to children. So they saw this, they were interested, and they worked with Arnett to do that. So they bought books from a local uh, minority-owned business here in Rochester. And some of the books were actually the same that were on the spines. So that kind of closed the loop. When children came to the library, they saw, for example, Goodnight Moon on the side of the library, then they came in and actually got the book. And then on the right, you can see little Juniper with her dad reading some stories. Uh, they were recipients of some of those books. And just one more Facebook post to show you. This is more recent, but this is the most recent uh, staff person hired on it at Arnett. This is uh, Kendra White, and she's with the, the uh, youth program. And where she chose to be photographed was next to the Langston Hughes book mural and for that great uh, quote, Hold Fast to Dreams. So what we did was give donors a feeling. Uh, they, they did this for me. Uh, we leveraged book donations, as I mentioned, with the first Tuesday book club. We received an email request uh, to fund an additional mural. There was a couple that was taking a walk one summer, uh, fall night during COVID, and emailed Bruce the next day and said, how much does one of those cost? We'd be willing to pick up the cost of one of those. So we're already uh, ahead for the next campaign. And we did meet our campaign goal and even a little bit more. We um, had a little bit extra and that's good because it's outside art and it is exposed to the weather. So it does need touch-ups from time to time. And those gifts, everyone was so special. It came in from a $5 cash donation from a, a patron who just happened to be coming by and liked them all the way up to a $500 gift. And this was from someone who had given to the Friends and Foundation for a long time but at a very modest level. And this was a, a big jump for her. And I called to, uh, to say thank you. And her response was kind of funny. She said, well, this is a project I actually want to give to, which made me think that uh, I think what she meant was uh, it gave her a good feeling to do this, uh, to have this in her neighborhood. So just in conclusion, um, I hope these are tips that you might be able to use, but whatever fundraiser you choose to do, whether it's a book sale or other, I hope that these relationship strategies might help you personalize your connection to your donors and friends to enhance the great work that you're already doing for your libraries. And I just wanna thank you for all you're doing to help libraries grow in your communities and throughout the state. So thank you very much for this time. And um, if there are... Sorry, if I'm, I'm not sure if you froze or if me if it's me freezing. Oh, no, I see you moving now. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca. That was great. And such wonderful projects to hear about. And um, those murals are just beautiful. That's amazing. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, some, I'm going to go through them and then we'll see how much time we have and see if we want to save some for the end. But the first one, um, this person shares, we have hemorrhaged membership over the past year. Do you have specific recommendations to re-engage with and renew members beyond general mail slash email follow-up to lapsed members? Hmm. The eternal question, how to get more volunteers and members and friends. Um, I know that the Friends of Libraries section has uh, 
workshops that Lisa We Met puts together. And there, there are many resources on the NILA FLS, uh, the NILA Friends of Libraries section webpage. I would suggest you, you take a look at those. Um, I think that um, if Lisa's on the call, maybe you could confirm that some of the, the Keep It Growing workshops and the Getting Started workshops are archived. So I think there are resources that might be able to help you there. And again, um, you know, would, would, your, would your library let you have a tour uh, and just show off a few things, put up a poster and just, just see who comes. And from that, you've got a little seed of somebody to start with. You know, if they're showing interest enough that they wanna come and learn more, then that's a good sign that they might wanna become involved. Yeah, that's great. And Lisa is here and I'll look for some links too when, when we uh, move on to the next presentation. But um, the next question, I'm not sure if you'll have this right now and I don't know if we wanna say this for the end, but do you have any stats on who does fundraising for most friends of the library groups? Is it all volunteer or do they have part-time slash full-time development staff? And you can speak for your organization, obviously. Oh, well, um, the Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library is a separate nonprofit organization. And we're structured with a staff of seven. And we are uh, specific, our, our, we function, we exist to raise money and support the library. So it's, it's uh, fundraising, it's programs, it's um, special spaces, you know, what we say, we put the, put the meat on the bones in terms of uh, extra support to the library. There are some libraries who do hire staff people um, I believe you're going to hear from Wood Library soon and, uh, and some others who may have actual staff people devoted to fundraising. I think in many cases, it does come to the friends and the volunteers. Uh, but again, I, I don't know if we have statewide statistics on that. I'm, I'm not sure. Thank you. Yeah, I know that's a, that was a broad question. So <laughs> I appreciate your, your uh, you talking about Rochester at least. Um, okay, we have time for maybe a couple of more. Have you seen success with a matched appeal? If yes, what was the value of the matched gift? And was that half or a different percent of the total campaign goal? And I can repeat any of that if you need me to. <laughs> Sometimes money talk. <laughs> I <head> around, so. <laughs> well, I think if I understand the question right, uh, they're wondering if there's a donor who puts up a certain amount of money, if that motivates others to give. Um, if I understand that correctly. We, we didn't do that for the mural project. Uh, we have done that for things like Rock the Day, which is the Giving Tuesday project in the Rochester area. And they, uh, from what the United Way says, any organization that has some kind of a match definitely raises more money because who wouldn't want to double their money? Your, your $1 gift turns into two. So who wouldn't want to do that? Uh, yeah, and if you can find a donor or a business, if you can uh, offer the business something in exchange, like maybe they are, you, you mention them in your peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaign, you know, with special thanks to ABC Business for uh, giving us this matching gift. Um, then that gives them a little bit of recognition and um, a little cause marketing, it, it probably uh, especially now would mean more um, to show that their their business is related to a cause and concerned about the community. Yeah, absolutely. Good PR all around. So sure. um, I'm going to do one last question that's more pertaining to you and, and what you were talking about, and then we'll move on to the next. Um, just to the people who have questions up there, I see you. I'm keeping the questions up and maybe we'll revisit them at the end. But the last one was about the artist for the murals. Uh, was that expensive? Well, um, he did the seven murals. I, I guess that depends on what you call expensive. Um, he did the seven murals for, uh, I think our goal was $2,250. Um, what did that come out to about 300 something per panel? And he has done work for us before. He is just terrific. And we felt it was well worth it. Um, I don't know what if there's a going rate for, for um, panelists, artists, 
uh, but we found that he was just terrific. He does beautiful work and brings on young people as his protégés. So that was especially meaningful to me. That's wonderful. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Um, well, you're welcome. And I just, uh, Rebecca, can I just show off the purse that I got at Purse of Palooza that you're going to hear about next? Uh, what a great a, lead in. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fabulous purse. And this is such a fabulous fundraiser you're going to hear about next. So um, looking forward to it. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca. That was a wonderful way to bring us to our next presenter. <laughs> so, so thank you. I know Rebecca will be sticking around. So if we have time at the end, we'll revisit some of these questions. Uh, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and bring on Kathy and Jenny from the Wood Library, and they'll be talking about Persepalooza, which Rebecca just showed off her, her goods from that. <laughs> yes, thank you, Rebecca. Believe it or not, we did not plan that. So yes, my name is Jenny Gunmo. I'm the executive director at Wood Library. And you'll also hear during this presentation from Kathy Shea. Uh, she is one of my trustees here at the library. So we are going to talk about Persepalooza. But first, um, I wanted to actually take a quick poll, if I could, of the type of library that you represent. Um, so if you can just start typing in the chat box and just let me know you know, is it a public library, municipal library, association library? Go ahead and just write that down. Um, but for those of you who don't know, Wood Library is an association library. We're located in the Finger Lakes region in Candagua, New York, and we're chartered to serve the Candagua City School District. And we serve a population just over 25,000. Um, as an association library, our board of trustees is elected by the members of the association at the annual meeting in January. Our budget for 2021 is 886,000. And we do receive uh, about 70% of our funding from the taxpayers in the school district, but we do need to raise the remaining 30% through various income sources like our annual fund drive, fines and fees, our endowment income, book sales, state aid, grants, and fundraisers. So this is just over 270,000 that we have to raise aside from the, the tax that we receive. Uh, we do have a Friends of Wood Library who support the library by purchasing items that are not included in the operating budget. So they purchase things like the annual movie license, summer reading prizes, um, they work on vote advocacy, um, but we do have a very active fundraising committee that's led by a board trustee. Um, we are also very fortunate to have a development specialist on staff. So um, we just had that question. And yes, we do have a paid staff person who manages our annual fund drive and works very closely with the board on fundraisers. So how are we looking with our poll answers? Is it a big mix of different libraries? Um, Jenny, it's mostly public libraries, a few association libraries smattered in there, and maybe oh, okay. a couple um, municipals, but most of them are public. All right. Well, school districts. Oh, yeah, school district libraries. Shout yeah. out to the school district libraries. libraries. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, Kathy. Okay. So, one of those fundraisers is Persapalooza. And um, the name says it all, right? I don't think I have to go any further than that. Uh, but really, um, Persepalooza is a purse and jewelry sale that is held on a November evening at the library. We like to call it the ultimate girls' night out. So what we do is we convert our large meeting room into a wintry retail shop with purses and jewelry on every table. I don't think these pictures do it justice, honestly, but the, the room is just filled with purses and jewelry. We have appetizers and wine and live music, and that adds to the ambiance of the event. And we offer two tiers of tickets. Uh, we have a champagne presale ticket um, and a general admission ticket. So those who paid for the champagne presale ticket, they are granted early access to the event, and they are also treated to champagne while they shop. So how do we get all this stuff? Now that's probably similar to your book sales. Uh, earlier in the year, we asked the public to clean out their closets and donate new or gently used items. A lot of effort by our team of volunteers is put into sorting, cleaning, and pricing each one to get them ready for the sale. 
And if I could do another quick poll, and I promise you this will be the last one. Um, how many of you actually held a fundraiser in 2020? I'm just really curious, because I know for us, um, we really had to think long and hard in early 2020, what we wanted to do or how we were going to do it. Um, and I'm assuming people were in the same boat as us. And I'm just curious, you know, how many people went ahead and did have some sort of fundraiser in 2020? And Kathy, what kind of uh, answers are you getting? Lots of no's and a few yeses. Modified book sales, um, calendar sales, some outdoor kids book sales. Yeah, yeah, we, we all had to be- Mail by mail. Yeah, we all had to get really creative in 2020, that's for sure. Can't, mail campaign. Oh, okay few things. Plant sale, book sales, basket raffles ongoing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So right. right. I'll, I'll pass it over to Kathy for history of the event. Okay. Um, I am Kathy Shea and I am actually a board, um, a board trustee. Um, and um, we just we just really want to kind of talk a little bit about the history of Persa Palooza. It was the brainchild of a, a former trustee, and she took a concept and just went with it. And um, it debuted in 2016 as Persa Palooza. And basically, um, you know, when you when you ever have a new event, you got to like think about the projected budget, the team of volunteers, logistics. Um, how are you going to promote it? Sponsorships. And I'll go into a little bit of, of those kind of details as we proceed through the slides. But, um, you know, I think as uh, Jenny said, uh, we, um, we really solicited donations from the community and it's a really great sustainability kind of philosophy that people are giving items that get to repurpose to, to other um, people in the community. So we, uh, we all, we as a, um, you know, group really love that idea. Um, we, there's new twist every year, we change it, we learn. And one of the things that I think is, um, been very interesting with Persepalooza is that it was more successful each year. It gets more and more um, successful. We uh, we make more money. We have more people sponsoring, um, and we truly have a loyal following of people that look to that girls' night out every year. Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion um, with on the board at one point is if Persepalooza had run its course and should we look to do something different? I think people that are involved in fundraising know that, but sometimes things just run their course and people lose interest. But we weren't finding that with Persepalooza. So we were, so we decided to kind of keep, you know, to keep it going. And it truly is a signature event with a loyal following. Next slide, Jenny. Some of the lessons we've learned with any kind of fundraising event, um, you really need a volunteer champion. Wood Library does have <coughs> a fund uh, development um, paid staff person, but she alone can't uh, put on this event as well the fundraising committee of the lot of the board can't. We really, but you need someone that kind of takes this on, is committed to it and um, has a passion for the event. Um, and the, the trustee that thought of Persepalooza was the champion for, um, to 2018 till she left the board. So then we needed a new, uh, champion. And I guess I, I got that title. Um, so what was really interesting, um, for, for me was, um, and for the group, was I had only been to Persepalooza once and just for like a few minutes. So I didn't really have a sense of it, 
But luckily, there were volunteers and staff people that had been involved from the beginning. So, but was but was was really nice as I brought in new volunteers. We it brings in new energy and new thoughts. And can we do it different? How can we do it better? What really was worked well and what didn't? So we made improvements every year. We changed the day of the event. It used to be Friday night. We switched it to Saturday um, because um, we thought, well, for a lot of reasons. One was, um, you know, people were rushing there on a Friday evening. Um, but also setup is really time consuming. And this way we had a little bit more time for setup. We let go of less profitable elements of the event. So we had done a lot with um, silent auctions and uh, uh, one year we did painted jewelry boxes. Another year we did painted purses, you know, kind of some different things that uh, are of interest, but they weren't very profitable. Um, so we kind of let go of those ideas. We kind of introduced an early bird ticket concept. Um, and what that, uh, that is, is that's like, I think Jenny mentioned it earlier. We have like a, champ, a champagne pre-event. So if people bought a ticket, I think it was $30, they get to come early and shop early. And then we have kind of general admission tickets um, like an hour and a half later. Um, and that was also a huge success because people love the event. They want to come. They want to get their purses. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it, it really was a, a nice little uh, perk to the event. We expanded to jewelry sales, um, which I have to tell you was, is in, in so many ways, a lot more work than purses because people bring in jewelry that's all knotted and um, not, you know truly costumes, but we really got some gems and some things that uh, um, uh, really led to some um, nice revenue for, for the library. Every year we need to evaluate our inventory. We clean it out, we re-donate. Um, and uh, if something, I mean, there's purses that will have been through Purse of Palooza for you know, five years. And I think there's a point that we were, we were starting to mark purses that have been, that are kind of, have gone through many purse of and we need to, to kind of maybe move them on to, uh, uh, to donate them to the goodwill. Um, one of the things that um, I did differently was I created a, a schedule for volunteers to help clean and sort purses. And we rented a room at, the, at a local church for additional storage space. So it would be like on a Friday night or a Saturday, Wednesday evening or Saturday afternoon. And people would sign up and come and help clean and sort, clean purses, sort jewelry. And it was great fun. And we got a great response to that. It's not a huge commitment. People would come and help us with the jewelry and the purses. Um, we did designate specific people to price and 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 choose what we're, you know, that sort of thing. So we didn't have everyone pricing, but it was, uh, but to kind of clean and sort, it was a wonderful event. But then 2020, what are we gonna do? We can't have Persepalooza. Should we cancel? Should we not? What should we do? And it really forced us to rethink the event entirely. The next slide. Persepalooza in a pandemic. I think the bottom line is we didn't want to give it up. We, we, it was a very successful event. People look forward to it. Um, and we had to really think about it. We had an inventory. We had purses. We might need to build it up a little bit but we had some purses to sell. Um, we, we met um, our committee, a group of community volunteers and some board members, as well as library staff met over many months thinking, how can we do this? Should we do it? What should we do? And um, we talked about online tools. Should we do an online store? How should we get sponsors? Should we do a raffle? Um, what platform should we use? Just lots of lots of different uh, discussions. Um, so um, if we're gonna 
how are people going to pick up purses if they buy them? Um, you know, so there's really a lot of thought that went into it. But our goal was we really wanted to keep it simple, but keep the flavor of the in-person Purse Palooza virtually. Um, so this is what we did. The next slide. Basically, we did do take. We created an online store, and um, Jenny's going to talk about this a little bit later. We using a platform the library was familiar with, which was Square. Um, we decided to do early bird ticket sales um, using another platform that we that the library uses a lot called Eventbrite. So we did sell tickets so people could get in the store early. Um, so it was like a four to six on a Saturday was an early tick. You could get in early. And then the store, the online store, stayed open for a whole week. We did do some selective recruiting for designer purses. So we reached out to women's groups, um, the Rotary, Carolinas, send out emails wanting just designer purses. We didn't want to get a lot of, um, you know, people when they clean out their closets, they bring us everything. But we really were looking specifically for designer purses because we weren't sure if this was going to work. So we didn't want to have a bunch of, we weren't sure how we were going to do it. So we limited to designer purses. We talked about jewelry and we developed this jewelry grab bag idea where we put a lot of our jewelry in like grab bags and people could, it was like a mystery bag. They could pay $10 and get a bag of jewelry. Um, we did mystery purses where we also just pick some of our nicer purses and people would get there was jewelry in those purses and they would pay a certain amount for that um then we also jenny will show you we also did raffle purses so we we um people in the community as well as board members donated brand new designer purses and we recruited sponsors and included like gift gifts in these like you know gift certificates for restaurants um uh um, yoga, you know, a variety of different things and created these raffle purses. And then we scheduled a day uh, for picking up the purses. Um, back to the ticket sales, what we also did is we got donations of champagne and chocolate. So those people that bought tickets and if in, we included champagne and chocolate with the items that they purchased. So um, just to let you know, the raffle purses were a huge success. We made um, a lot of money on, on, on that. It was surprising. The jewelry grab bags, mystery purses, not so much. We probably wouldn't do that again. The designer purses, we had about 100 designer purses on site. And I think we sold about between 60 and 70. Um, and uh, um, we, one of the big things that we did and um, we hired a professional, not hired, we had a volunteer who was a professional photographer. So, and um, when Jenny shows the website, you'll see more about how that worked. That was, a, uh, that was one of the, I think the, one of the committee members thought that was a really good idea. And she was absolutely right. That really made a big difference in the professionalism of the site. So um, next slide. Okay, Jenny. Thanks. Back to you. me. All right. Thanks, Kathy. <laughs> All right. So here's a glimpse of the homepage of the retail shop. Um, as Kathy said, uh, we decided to settle on Square to use for creating our website. I know there are a lot of options out there, but we were already familiar with using Square here at the library because that's actually what we use for collecting fines and fees. Um, and Square, I don't think it's overly complicated. It's, I think it's actually very easy to use and its transactional fees are part of the expenses. Um, Square offers uh, an intuitive step-by-step -step guide uh, when designing your online store and they use Weebly. Uh, we did not purchase the custom domain um, and just use the free Square domain that was provided to us. But I did have to upgrade our Square plan to enable the password protect feature um, I didn't want people gaining early access to the store while I was still working on the site. 
Um, so I had to lock that down. And that was an additional $12 a month for the, the few months that I was working on it. Um, so as you can hopefully see, I was able to include a top navigation bar. Um, you'll see the, the retail shop, of course. We were able to create a little spot to list all of our sponsors, uh, what the event is about, and if um, anyone needed to contact us, they could do that through this link here. Um, this image here, uh, we use that for all of our promotional materials, so the postcards, um, any e-blasts that we sent out, social media, we were kind of using this image to help brand the event. And as Kathy said, we use Eventbrite for selling those uh, champagne pre-sale tickets. So I can't recommend the professional photography enough. Um, and again, as Kathy said, we are lucky to have a very talented photographer on the Friends of Wood Library and he provided us his service free of charge. Um, and we were able to borrow a photo box. You might've seen those um, where you put the, the product inside the box and you're, you have a nice clean white background and you snap an image or take a picture of it. And that just gives you that really nice clean look. Um, all of these items were one of a kind. There were no multiples. Um, so something that we did discover um, as the store opened and as we had sales come through was that if you put it in your um, shopping cart, there was the possibility of it being snatched from underneath you if you haven't paid for it yet. So that, that was something that we learned that we weren't anticipating. Um, so I'm not sure how we'll fix that in the future, but it's something that we haven't forgotten about. Um, we also made up um, fun descriptions for each purse and we measured each one so that shoppers could get a sense of the size of the purse. That was something that we decided to go back and do because I know for myself when I'm shopping, I like to know how big the pouch is, you know, what's the strap look like. It's kind of hard to visualize that when you're just, um, you know, you're looking at an image on the screen. So it's kind of hard to, you know, know what, what it actually looks like in person. So uh, Kathy mentioned the purse raffle. Here is the page um, for that. And we had uh, five purses and they were all brand new designer bags. And um, as Kathy said, they were a huge success. I think that's because the price point was reasonable. So it was $5 a ticket. And the purses um, and the items they were stuffed with. So here's again, one of the raffle bags. Um, unfortunately got cut off down here. Um, but they were all stuffed with um, gift certificates to, you know, local restaurants or, um, you know, different um, things that, you, uh, I don't know, like, for example, this one here has um, an hour long flight lesson from the Rochester Air Center packed into it. So, um, you know, they're like unique one of a kind items that you might not be able to get anywhere else. Um, I know uh, there might be some like makeup or you know, other little trinkets that were in there, but we did list it all out and we were sure to include the value of um, each item too. So people knew exactly what they were, what they were trying to bid on. Um, and we also found out too, and I, I think the raffle was a success because, you know, the, the product did go fast in the store. Uh, we did sell majority of the products. Um, so maybe when you logged in, there wasn't really anything that interested you, but you were still willing to spend a couple, you know, dollars here and there on a few raffle ba bags that you were willing to take a chance on. Um, so Kathy, I don't know if you want to talk about the, the success of the event. Yeah, I think it was, it was really successful. I mean, I think we made, I think I see some questions. I think we made about um, $7,000, um, which I think in the in-person event, we would, we would use, we would make it, we were making about last year, the 2019, I think we made about 13,000. So um, I think we were just thrilled um, and people, were very um, receptive to it. I think people had fun with it. Um, and 
we sold most of the items. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, I always said this to Jenny, we sold some purses that I did not think we would sell, but we did. So it was very, very, uh, very exciting. Um, I think some, um, we, we just don't know what the future is going to bring. Um, so we think we're going to do it, virt do a hybrid event in uh, November. I think we're going to do the, continue to do the purses virtually, but we're going to kind of, kind of have a pop-up retail store for jewelry that people maybe be open for a couple hours or a day so we can kind of monitor numbers and people would be comfortable kind of coming in and browsing at all our jewelry that we have. So I think that's how we're gonna, that's the talk um, right now. But to, um, I think we have new supporters, people that hadn't been involved with Persepalooza were involved, um, you know, people that lived in other parts of the country got involved. Um, like my daughter bought purses and she lives in Maryland. Um, so it was really a, it was a, it was a, it was a big success. And one of the things I think we'll, we'll, we'll do is uh, increase the number of purses we have online um, in November. But uh, some of the questions that I see is um, average price of purse. Um, 30, I think. What do you think, Jenny? Yeah, I would say that's fair. Um, 30. They really, they really covered the gamut, though. Um, yeah. You know, Lisa, sometimes um, we got a really nice designer bag, and like uh, it. it was brand new, never used, still had the tags on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we would obviously ask for less than, mm -hmm. you know, what it was retailing for. Yeah. Um, we would then, do we would do research on what they would what they're kind of selling. We would look at different sites um, and kind of come up with a price. Like um, we did get a very nice in perfect condition Gucci, which are sell for you know like fifteen hundred dollars. So we did put a high price tag on that, and we were able to sell it. So we try and be reasonable, but also make a profit you know we do you know do a little bit of both um yeah i don't see are there more questions rebecca do we have time yeah we've got a couple of minutes and you just answered some of the questions that came through so thank you for that um about the prices and how you set the prices so that's great um I know that you mentioned, Kathy, the price of one of the tier tickets, but how much were the two tiers for the ticket? Well, for the for the in live the live event, we would do 30 and I think it was 15. Yeah, you're right. General admission. Right, Jenny? Yep, yep, that's right. And then for the virtual event, it was 30 to shop early and then it was free. <laughs> then we didn't charge anything. And I think that's why we did so well with those um, raffles, to be perfectly honest with you. I think because people would just go on and buy a raffle ticket. I mean, we so, I don't know. I think we made like almost $3,000 on the raffles for $5 a ticket. That's a lot of, that's a pretty good return. Yeah, I that's think. a lot of tickets. That's amazing. Yeah. And yeah. then same, another ticket related question. Does the admission, does the price they're paying for the admission ticket apply to the items sold or is it just completely separate? Completely separate. Okay. Cool. Um, that's a nice idea though, but. <laughs> <laughs> for next year. <laughs> um, all right, let me do one last question since we're, we've got about a minute left. Um, how far in advance do you plan or well I guess they're asking for that first event but how far in, in advance did you plan and start collecting purses I think initially the event started like maybe collecting purses in September or August for the November event we we were switching that and and collecting purses earlier um we kind of organized how we were collecting purses um and kind of divided them up when we got them so I I think we're gonna probably start collecting purses. We're collecting them now for the November event. So if anyone has any purses, you can bring them down to the Wood Library. But um, but yeah, so I think we were, because we felt like people were cleaning out and needed to start 
earlier. So yeah, we, yeah our inventory is low. We got to build it up. Hint, hint. What? <laughs> hint, hint. Send us your purses. <laughs> that's why we held this webinar. <laughs> yes, that's right. Purses. And, you saw, and you saw that beautiful purse that Rebecca got. <laughs> that could yes. be you. That could and be you next year. <laughs> and you guys can come to our virtual event. <laughs> Well, it's five o'clock. We had a couple of more questions, but I think some of them were answered. And I saw Jenny, you'd provided the contact information for both you and Kathy and Rebecca had provided her contact information. Once again, I'm going to share out materials next week once I have a chance to fix the captioning on this. Um, and you'll have links to those presentation so you can contact Jenny, Kathy, or Rebecca if you have any further questions. But I just wanted to thank all three of you as well as Lisa and the Friends of the Library section for, for putting us all together. Um, and this was wonderful. I'm seeing a lot of thank yous and you you all are doing great work and, and interesting fundraisers. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear about it. Great. Thank you, everyone, and thank you all for attending. Um, I hope, I don't know, it just started snowing again for a second here, so I hope it stops snowing where you are soon. Um, <laughs> happy Earth Day, where we can yeah. barely see the ground. <laughs> but thank you all for attending, and thank you, Jenny, Rebecca, and Kathy. Uh, we appreciate the work that you do, and um, I hope everyone has great success in their next fundraisers. So enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. You too. Bye.